Hello everyone and welcome to our latest hit of Rugby Nation. I'm Sean Maloney and alongside me is Ian Payton. And in the middle we are in the presence of a goal-kicking Australian women's 15s playing legend Emily Robinson. Payton, how good is this? Welcome, Em. Thank welcome. you. Thanks welcome. for having me. Uh, look, let's get straight into it. Uh, we'll go Wallaroos straight off the bat. Give us a rundown as to what's to come this year for you and your green and gold wearing teammates and a quick recap on Super W and how did you end up as champions? Well, that's a lot. Um, <laughs> Two quick questions. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, I'll start with Super W. That's freshest. Sure. Um, yeah, obviously we had another win this year, which was awesome. Um, it's pretty very hard competition uh, this year and, yeah, I guess... Last year we looked at um, a lot of teams that have gone back to back and there wasn't that many to look at. So, um, yeah, I guess we tried to take from them, you know, parts of their game or parts of what they did and uh, use that for our own motivation or um, game plan. So it paid off in the end and, um, yeah, it was a pretty close final and a bit too stressful. It's a bit like last year, but, um, yeah, we got the win. So uh, that was an awesome start to the year. And can then, I, Before you go on, can I ask you this? One quick um, uh, verdict from you. How did the Super W change from season one to season two? Was it a lot tougher? Was it were, were the teams better prepared? What, um, what, what jumps out at you? Yeah, I would say people knew how to um, find each other's weaknesses better than the first year. It was the first year was kind of a learning curve of watching people play week in week out, and then the second year was more like, all right, this is what New South Wales has done. This is how we're gonna um, expose that area of their game and so you had to be I guess a lot more uh, prepared and um, I guess tactical in how you played and what you showed each team each week and making sure you didn't use all your tools in your bag so yeah, right. yeah I guess that was a big difference and um, obviously it's always just especially in New South Wales a lot of competition for spots and um, yeah it just keeps growing so. What, so what's next? So Wallaroos season now, you're in camp, you're going through all the bits and pieces there. What have you got on the table in 2019? Yeah, so um, a big year for the Wallaroos. There's uh, two test matches against Japan and uh, a park match as well. So uh, we play a test up in Newcastle and then um, a test at North Sydney Oval and then uh, two tests against the Black Ferns, uh, one in Perth and one in Auckland. So yeah, everyone's um, around the country training uh, in their states with those uh, Wallaroos girls at the moment. And then, yeah, hopefully uh, whoever gets selected gets to go to camp and, um, yeah, hopefully get some wins on the board. This is a really good, like, space that we're in, I reckon, Emily. Like, you only have to go back, what, five years? Between 2014 and 2016, you were eligible pl to play for the Wallaroos, but you didn't because there were zero test matches played. Like, the fact you're playing four now in a year and there's plans maybe even to sort of expand that up to five and six next year. How good is that? Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, obviously I got um, injured for the 2014 World Cup, so I didn't go to that. But for, yeah, two years, I didn't debut until uh, October in 2016. So for two years, there was no tests. And um, it's really hard to turn up and play against teams that are playing um, consistently and against really good countries. So, um, yeah, it makes all the difference being able to play heaps of tests and <clears throat> getting to play against uh, Japan is something different, mm. uh, someone different to New Zealand and um, obviously we get to play New Zealand every year which is awesome but uh, it's good to you know change it up, spice up your life. No doubt the two games against Japan will put you in good shape for those two matches against the Black Ferns. Uh, how close is that gap now between the Wallaroos and those across the Tasman? <laughs> um, I think it's a lot closer than people think. Uh, I think last year was really like, obvious that, you know, in two weeks that we spent together, we closed that gap a lot and I think it just made people realise that, uh, you know, they are beatable and um, we, you know, if we really want it and put everything we can into it, then uh, it's ours to take. So um, I believe that uh, we can win this year and, uh, yeah, I hope, you know, 22 or 35 other girls believe the same thing. So Fingers crossed, looking forward to that down the well, track. What interests me, Sean and Emily, is the um, where Australian women's rugby will be in 2021 because we, we've spoken about... We, we're behind the eight ball, really, aren't we? we? We've only just come on board with Super W. Um, up north, they've been playing a lot more test matches. The Six Nations is played up there. And, and they say that in 2017, it was really noticeable... Um, amongst those northern nations that they'd played a lot together. So, Emily, what do you reckon by 2021 with a few more seasons of Super W, hopefully a few more 
long campaigns in the test arena. How much of an impact do you think that'll have with for you guys in, in that tournament? Yeah, huge. Um, obviously, that's a big goal at the moment, the 2021 World Cup. And, um, yeah, I think that the more you play, the better you are as a team and individually and, um, you know, as a unit. So the more we play, the better we get. So mm. if we keep playing more games, we'll... Better we get. I'm going to hit you with one last one around where you're at before we jump into Super Rugby. Uh, in your opinion, and obviously can't be yourself, but who would be the first picked in the Australian Wallaroos side at the moment off the back of the Super W? Ooh, you can play favourites. <laughs> uh, I'd just like to know, that's my roundabout way of asking who was the MVP of Super W, who would be the first picked in the Australian side if it was selected right now? Um, oh, there's heaps. I just wanted one. You could have gone with any any one of the but many it's, it's many difficult women because you the just squad. well you start at the top and you write down number one. <laughs> <laughs> I just said, I just said with the exclusion of yourself. Okay, okay well then we'll keep. I'll do it. I'll do it. Okay, I'll do it for Emily. Well, number one, Emily Robbins. <laughs> okay, there you there go. You go. You're locked and we'll loaded. See. You're good to you go. You need a goal kicker and you need a loose head prop. <laughs> Speaking of locked and loaded, uh, the Brumbies look like they are headed in the right direction for a final spot in 2019 off the back of their big win on the weekend against the Summers. A shutout down in Canberra, 33 zip in the end. And the Brumbies, Pado, they mixed their game plan up beautifully and scored some cracking long range tries. Well, in your absence, Sean, uh, last week while you were at the, the Battle of King's Landing, um, uh, w you know, we talked a lot about are they a rolling mall team only? You know, It was the topic um, of the week last week. They showed that they are not. Um, probably the most complete performance they've shown since they beat the Chiefs early doors. Um, lots of long-range tries. Henry Spatelet was really good. Tevita Kurundrani coming back was a big, a big factor there too. But, um, geez, they're sitting pretty. You know, like they've got... A buy coming up. Um, they've got Rory Arnold and Lockie McCaffrey still to come back, and they've also got like the, the best player in the world uh, yet to come back into their team as well. With well, one you know, of the best players in the world, we haven't seen him for so long. I've forgotten how he goes, David Pocock. <laughs> it's David, David, da David, David, David. Yeah, David um, no, I mean, yeah, it's uh, it's a strange one, that isn't it? It's um, you know a calf injury. Uh, it's not something that um, you'd expect to have taken this long. Um, but are they being really ultra cautious or is there something to be worried about there? I'm not sure. Uh, I guess that's a good segue into the way that you guys round out your premiership this year as well, Em. Uh, in terms of timing your run towards when it matters most, do you like what you've seen of the Brumbies across the last little bit? Um, yeah, I think Falafinga is the most try-scoring hooker I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, he's, he knows his way across mm. the strike, yeah. three last week. He's um, going along very well at the moment. Yeah, um, yeah. I think the Brummies are looking pretty good and um, obviously pretty solid forward pack. And yeah, I think they're obviously doing pretty well coming first, so we'll see. Can we tap your expertise? Why are they so good at that rolling mall? I know that we've just discussed that they've got more than that, but that's up their back pocket now. Um, what, are the, what are the really key factors? When you look at that Brumbies rolling mall, what are they doing right? No, I think they all just know their role. They're all just super tight. Um, it's slow. It's not, you know, rushed. And uh, it's just everyone knows what to do. And they all, you know, it doesn't matter who's scoring. A lot of times people are kind of, who's got the ball, who's doing this, who's doing that. And it's just get in and go hard. And, you know, they must have worked on it a lot. And they probably saw that it was a weakness in other people's defence, defensive lineouts uh, mm. throughout the preseason. And... Yeah, so I oh know they're killing it. I'd like a tip. The other, uh, the other thing that that is now doing as well that really more we saw at the weekend. The Sunwolves actually defended it quite well through the first half, but that created opportunities and space in other parts of the field, and that led to Henry Spate's second try. So uh, that mix-up of big men and flies doing well. And you touch on Travita Kurandrani. That was as well as I've seen him playing quite some time. He's really starting to hit some Good form. to hit. Good ha to have him back in form. Um, I, I really like the idea when we get to the World Cup that you've got Samu Karevi and Tevita Kurandrani in the, in the midfield together. I'm, I'm a big fan of um, big humans in that midfield. The Rebels run towards the finals. Uh, too good on Friday night against the Reds in I'm going to call it a scrappy encounter. There was some scrappiness mixed up with some sublime work from the scrappy, Rebels. Scrappy, dour? Did they grind, no, I don't, I don't grind their I way to win? I think it was dour. I don't think it was a grinder because there were too many points on the board for it to be either of those two things. But certainly, yeah, there was a, a couple of mistakes in the mix. But there were some also, also were some terrific tries scored by the Rebels. Uh, Reese Hodge and Quay Cooper, Billy Meeks, all very strong through that uh, channel. 
inside channel. Well, it's a, a little, and Emily could probably tell us about this. It's in those finals. Is when um, two teams are desperate to win. You get that. The level of competition sort of takes the intensity level up. And I think about that that final this year where you guys were making um, quite a few uncharacteristic mistakes just because mm. there's so much on the line. And and I think that's what we saw in that game. Both of those two teams needed to win that, the Rebels in particular. They dropped three on, on the bounce before that. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I mean, both of them really needed to get that win to stay in the mix. The Australian Conference is... Um, well, yeah, it's an odd the beast at the moment, isn't it? They're still inside the top eight now, the Rebels. So yeah. uh, we've got two runners where we thought we might not have had mm. any outside of those who finished top of the Aussie Conference. So that's good mm. for Aussie rugby that they're both banging away for the moment. It's a tough run home for the Rebels. Uh, but with Dane Haylett-Petty in the sort of form that Dana Formi was in on Friday night, maybe they'll, maybe they'll be able to ask some questions at the back end. Yep, uh, that 15 jersey is going to be fascinating. Um, lots of people sticking their hands up. For I think everyone forgets that Dane Haylett Petty, I think he's actually the incumbent um, at 15, is he? Because Izzy finished on the wing. So regardless of what happens with, with Israel, like I think Dane um, is, would, would be sort of have, have rights to that jersey anyway. But look, Tom Banks is in the mix. Kurtley is showing he loves playing fullback. Um, so yeah, that I mean, it's great to see, actually. Um, uh, and what do you reckon? Do you do you see? I mean, you you see Kurtley around the joint yeah. all the time. <clears throat> yeah, I think I don't think anyone has rights to a jersey. I think it's uh, probably the wrong thing to say, but um, it's good that they're fighting for that position. And if those three, you know, plus others are fighting for that spot, it's only going to mm. make them better. So um, I think KB's probably shown something different uh, to what everyone's used to. Everyone's used to him playing in the middle mm. and um, probably not using his freakish skills as much as he's been able to have the freedom at fullback but um yeah I'm not a fullback but I uh, wouldn't want to have Czech's job to pick that um but yeah it's whoever's you know competing the best and mm. getting the best out of themselves will get the jersey in the end okay for me one of the highlights of the game on Friday night wasn't actually during the game it was delivered post-match and I've just heard someone singing happy birthday here in the offices as well. So I reckon this is the perfect segue into what for me is one of the highlights, not just from Friday night, but from the entire year. Here's Taniela Tupo. Happy birthday. Tanya, show it up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to me. Happy birthday to me. All right, so much, so much right and fun and good about that, but so much weird and a bit out there with my colleague I just Nick McArdle wanna, I, I, going I, in with a kiss yeah. on Taniella Tupo. I want to know uh, which HR department to call. <laughs> <laughs> which which what, the HR one or yeah, the RA uh, one or I, the I Fox one? I got some issues. I think oh, that there was a bit I, of personal space <laughs> being encroached <laughs> upon there. But how how funny was that? I mean, that is so good seeing the characters like that from our Super Rugby side starting to come through, like we see it from you as well am yeah it's good it's um like obviously you know everyone's got their own personality and um I think it's a shame sometimes that gets cut out by you know having to say the right thing or you know act in a certain way and obviously it was just a uh, big man likes a bit of cake so uh, <laughs> I think it might have been a donut that he was powering through <laughs> really and I'm told I'm told that Brad Thorne was watching on and apparently they've had uh, over the years a couple of not issues but they've had to keep a keen eye on Taniella and his diet and when Nick handed in the donut Thorny's eyes were like what is going on over there but who's going to get that back off him I mean he was three bites in in milliseconds you play the way he did on Friday night you can eat what you like bank maximum minutes try assist was strong at scrum time he's he's another one who's going along really well at the moment Taniela Tupo and how mobile is he like you saw him set up that Isaac Lucas try so mobile him yeah every prop thinks they're a 10 so um no it's amazing to see you know he's obviously a big body and super strong but um yeah he's got amazing skills and get little Zaki over the line for his mm. first try. So next up, the Reds will have the Waratahs this weekend back at home. The Tars return to Australia 0-2 from their time in South Africa. Admittedly, uh, results haven't gone their way, but they did manage to string some decent food together in between as well. Yeah, another one-point loss for the Tars. They're, they're bonus point kings this year. Unfortunately, they're all the losing bonus points. Um, so what's that make it? Seven losses, all under eight points.
Um, tough one there in, in Joburg. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, like, we are talking about it before, you don't want to moan about a ref, and I know that we'll come to the ref. Um, the Waratahs, I think, um, after what was a sort of a, a ding-dong, try-for-try first half, it got a lot tighter, and in the second half they didn't control their ball as much as they'd like to, you know, kicking away a lot, a few turnovers in the red zone. Um, but the last 20 minutes they got caned by referee Egon Seconds, who um, has a bit of form at Ellis Park, you could say, Sean. Well, when you say form, you mean in terms of penalty counts against Australian teams this That's year? That's exactly what I mean. What's the numbers this year? So he, uh, on, with the Rebels uh, versus Lions, he, he gave a penalty count of 20 to 1 against the Rebels, and this was 11 2, so that makes it 33. <laughs> Th- 31 to 3, pardon me. The so, 20 to 1 one still gets me. Like, I remember watching that and just going, hang on, wait, what? Yeah. How is that possible across 80 minutes of rugby that one team could be hammered so strongly on the penalty front and one team could be so squeaky clean? I mean, just in terms of stats, you, I don't think you'll ever see numbers like that ever again. Have you ever seen or heard of? No, nah, that's – it's huge and, <clears throat> yeah, it's hard. Like, you don't want to blame the ref for much, but that's a – there was hard. Just, it's and there was hard some, to come back from you want to just some bizarre moments as well, which have been yeah. clipped up and circulated online, uh, getting involved in helping clean out Michael Hooper at one of the yeah. parks, yeah. Um, bumping into Nedley Hannigan. It was just, it was just, a, just one of those well, the, strange old nights at one in the one in the morning where it wrapped up. Poor old Emily can't can't comment too much. She's got that big Waratah <laughs> thing on her I chest. Know. But there's there's um, if I can talk on a on a player's behalf, what they want is a fair cop, right? So the thirty. Three bit is probably fine in the normal scheme of things. It might be a bit heavy, but it's the three that is the really weird bit. Like, how are there not penalties found against the lines? You know what I mean? So it's um, it's the double banger. It's the ones you feel like you're hard done by, and then the ones that they get away with as well. So, yeah, so 50-50s. Like, yeah. if you're giving a team every single 50-50, then it's not a 50-50. Um, and in that last 20 minutes, essentially the Waratahs um, really struggled to get out of there their end you know there was a couple of couple of rough calls actually funnily enough I think um, the one that they eventually kicked over the lines was a fair call it was just a straight offside Um, but um, there was a couple of scrum wins that they had there was a couple of um, fair um, pilfers that they were entitled to as you as you mentioned the ref um, helped clean out Um, but so uh, he's doing a good job if he can clean out hoops yeah yeah well that's (laughs) a good point put it this way that that Daryl Gibson who's one of the most mild-mannered characters doing the rounds, um, brought it up in, in the post-match presser in a very polite way. But if he's even bringing it up, you know, that, that there's a uh, myth behind the scenes. And I'm, I'm told privately that they are. They're not very happy at all, just as the Rebels weren't happy. And, and um, you know, I, look, I'd be surprised if we see too much more of um, referee seconds this season. Well, that fixture has gone against the Tars, which means they have a must-win game against the Reds this weekend. As we touched on, uh, that's, that's like... It's lo- basically the loser goes home in terms of your run to the finals this week, essentially, between those two sides. Yeah, well, yes, it depends on other people, I suppose, but it's just Most such likely, a weird though. year, isn't it? Yeah, like, so there's still out. only seven points between um, the Brumbies and the Waratahs down on... Uh, they're in fourth at the moment, aren't they, mm. Sean? You can correct me if yeah. I'm wrong. No, I, I, yeah, I just feel like whoever loses that loses that you reckon one they're gone? this year yeah. in terms of the finals. Um, I'll bet you coffee on it that that's probably the end of them in terms of their finals aspirations. Here's a, here's a question that I reckon is interesting. Despite teams like the Waratahs, let's say they squeak out the win and, and are sort of they've been hit and miss, missing these um, games by points here and there, but then they make the finals. You have to say that a team like the Waratahs or even the Rebels or the Reds or the Brumbies are a shot of knocking off good teams. It's history says no. Well, in the finals, history says no. You think the home ground advantage it's just means too, too, it's much. too much? to overcome. Especially if you finish 1-2, you're playing in a final. You're most likely quinellaring it, and away you go. That's well, what history says. Uh, okay, speaking of finals, the Australian women's sevens team won through to the big one in Langford across the weekend and played, I'm happy to say this, and I don't think it will be in any dispute, their best sevens in a long time. Long time. They were wonderful over there in Canada, going down to New Zealand in the big one. Yep, sure were. Um, they haven't really hit a, a good patch of sort of consistent form all year, have they? Um, and looked really good in in beating Canada, first of all, on, in the pool rounds, and then France, particularly in the semi final, and then came up against the old foe, New Zealand, in the final. And to be fair, they had every chance to win that mm. game as well. 
Yeah, I think they were um, obviously the best that they've been this year. Um, and just building, you know, new combinations with, you know, losing a few players like Emily Cherry and those kind of girls. Um, but yeah, I think they're going good. I, Got to say that I live with Sammy Traherne, but um, no, nah, I think they went really well. Scored the try in the final, didn't she, Sammy? She think... scored a couple of tries along the way. Yeah, kicked a few goals. Kicked so. few goals. Mm. No, I think they went really well, and um, as we said before, it's all about peaking when it matters. So, it's, uh, here's a theory for you: for the Olympics. Top five Australian footballers, Elia Grant would be in it. She is enormous for that team, and she's she's the difference between them playing like rock stars and playing. Um, like something less than rock stars, you know. She's a uh, she's acoustic um, guitar. Yeah, yeah, folk folk <laughs> a folk act. Um, but look at the impact she had on that final two tries. Yes, um, that one that one shot she made as well when she yeah. rushed up and uh, yeah, exactly. Nile yeah, yeah, Williams, Sonny yeah. sister. Well, yeah, and so they, and they and it was, John Menenti, it was awesome. John Menenti, um, you know, has to play tactically with with Elia because she clearly sort of, um, you know, that doesn't have that impact. If they play her all all six games every minute, so they they rest her until you know the championship minutes and she delivers. So um, if this team is going to defend their Olympic title, she'll be a huge uh, part of that. And it was a deep bench that John Manetti had to work with on the weekend as well. You saw the cattle he had to bring off the pine, mm -hmm. and it was mm -hmm. it was decent a decent uh, set up and squad. Alicia Quirt was also excellent over in Langford. They're also as missing well. Varney got injured, so she didn't mm -hmm. play the final. Who's a huge part of that team. So speaking of best players in the Australian rugby, I've had them in my top five. Varney Cleety, and Elia Grant. No, I just probably have Varney in there. Well, I'll, well let's have, have one more there. coffee. That Elia Grant will be Women's Sevens Player of the Year. This okay, year. has to be. Do you reckon? It's what do you think about Elia playing for you, playing on the on the ding for the Wallaroos in twenty one? That'd be a handy. Um, yeah, she actually she played fifteens with us for Warringah um, for her first year of rugby when she moved up to Sydney. So. Mm. Um, yeah, it's a completely different game and uh, whether or not she wanted to do it would be another question. But um, yeah, I think uh, like she's obviously powerful and very fast mm. um, and I guess there's a lot of things for her to learn if she wants to do that and if she wants to do it, then go for it. She'd but. struggle to make the New South Wales women's team though at the moment. They're so good. <laughs> That's so what do you good. reckon? Uh, speaking of so good. We are, as we said, at the top of uh, this week's Rugby Nation in the presence of one of the great goal-kicking forwards in not just Australian rugby, in world rugby. Now, I've got to take you back. Wallaroos last year, first test match, ANZ Stadium. Penalty gets awarded to the Wallaroos. I'm commentating alongside uh, Tiana Penatani and uh, Jem Etheridge. And I see this one wander in grab a kicking tee, and I said, no, this can't actually be happening. And it eventuates in front of me, Pato. And it gets striped through the sticks. I think, look, I think it's fair to say that, um, you know, it's a rare, a rare club of Australian goal kicking forwards, Emily Robinson and John Eels. They're pretty much on a par, I'd say. Their careers <laughs> are... Was he your inspiration to pick up the kicking tee? Nah, I, um, I played soccer for about 10 years. My dad's a soccer player, so I played that when I was a kid along with rugby and I don't know, I just um, kick goals. I used to, I loved Matt Guido when I was a kid, watched a lot of Wallaby's games with him and I used to, I had his headgear and thought I was pretty cool, but I'm actually a prop, so yeah, but no, nah, I don't know, I just, um, I don't know, kick, kick a ball all right and... I guess that was that was. Have the... you have you had any coaching from Gits as yet? I reckon that's something that should be teed up. Mm. Nah, I don't, I, I don't know if I'll ever you kick again. His, you don't want his. Do you think? Do you lessons? think Gits needs some coaching? That <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's towards the end of his I career. I reckon we can make that happen. I reckon a little one-on-one -on -one session with you and Matt yeah, Gitto, knowing up. that he was your idol. That's your job for the rest of this week to make that happen. Let's hope that um, uh, Emily gets a chance as. The great John Eels did, and it, this it's a good sec segue for the throwback. This kick will decide the fate of the Blenners Loka. What a player, John Eels! There's two two memories that jump out for me. It's '98 when when John Eels took over the kicking from Berkey. Said Berkey, thanks, give me the tea. You're missing them all. I'll yep. kick to home to a 
3-0 series win. And then, of course, 2000, Wellington, the cake tin. Uh, where are you playing this year? Auckland, it's yeah, not Auckland. the cake tin. Yeah. But We're still happy for you to pop one extra time. in Auckland at yeah. Park. Extra I actually time. missed my kick in um, Eden Park. I snapped my finger in half and I couldn't put the ball on the tee and I couldn't look at where I was kicking it. So, yeah, that was, that was a miss from me. But I'm um, happy to redeem myself. Yeah, a rare miss. Okay, well, we can make that happen. So that's, <laughs> right. the, that's our recap, our flashback looked after and a little and look a, at one a, of the great kickers in yeah, world rugby. Back to the future. Well, that is a perfect way to... Combine this week's look back at Eelsey along with one of the other all-time kickers in world rugby uh, team. It's been a lovely catch-up, Em. Awesome having you on the panel as well to give us an update on all things in your world, particularly with the Wallaroos and what's coming up. When's the first test match against Japan? Remind us. Our 13th of July. 13th of July. Newcastle. Where? Newcastle. Yeah. Lovely little spot up there. Yeah, as great well. venue. In the Hunter. Where else would you be? Pato, thank you for uh, giving us a hand as well. And thank you to you as well for dialing in to our most recent Rugby Nation. We'll catch you all again, same place, next week.